The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Welcome back to the Retro Rangers podcast. I am your host, George Grimm, and I'm joined this evening by Ralph Zig Tycho, the leader of our merry little band of podcasters, as we share our memories of the old Madison Square Garden on on uh, 8th Avenue between 49th and 50th Street. Ralph, thank you for being on my show on your network. Oh, thank you for having me. It's uh, my pleasure. We're talking about a subject that is really near you. I, uh, my memories of uh, of New York in those days and the garden and pole grounds and Empire State Building, uh, they're, ter- they're terrific. And um, they were built at a time when we both were most impressionable and yeah. um, subject to what I call Walter Mittyism. We are we are both somewhat of Walter Mitty, um, and it's a pleasure to have those memories. So thank you again. Okay, all right. Let me let me give a little backstory about the Yale Garden before we get started. It's the third building to carry that Madison Square Garden name. Um, it was built in 1925 by Tex Rickett, who was a a boxing promoter. Uh, it was. Um, Built in a in a remarkable uh, 249 days at a cost of five and a half million dollars. It was uh, primarily built for uh, for a boxing, but it opened in November of that year with a six day bicycle race. Now, um, a little known fact about the the uh, bicycle races, uh, Muzz Patrick who later played and coached and general managed the Rangers, is the only athlete to, to play in three sports at the Old Garden. He, he uh, boxed, he um, took part in the six-day bicycle races, and, of course, he played hockey. So that's um, something to think about. Wow. Um, now, except for the famous marquee in the front of the building, the Old Garden would probably – Looked like an old, you know, like a factory or an office building. There was nothing really to make it stand out. Um, that uh, marquee uh, proudly said Madison Square Garden, uh, but it it uh, didn't spell out the word square. It just said S Q, and the Q on the 49th Street side of the um, marquee was always um, always crooked. Now, uh, down on street levels was uh, Neenix Hot Dogs and Adam's Hats and uh, Regal Shoes. And on the, on the 50th Street corner w- was uh, Jerry Cosby's Sporting Goods, which uh, got a lot of business from, um, from the Rangers or from the Garden. Um, the old Garden was where Marilyn Monroe famously sang Happy Birthday, Mr. President, to John F. Kennedy in 1962. Whoa. I didn't realize it was at the garden. And it was also the uh, the uh, backdrop of the 1962 movie, The Manchurian Candidate, with Frank Sinatra, um, Lawrence Harvey, and Janet Leigh. So, as you know, there were some fil- uh, some scenes filmed in the garden. You, if if you watch the the uh, movie, you can see that you know there's a lot of that. Um, you know, of the film that was actually, you know, taken at Madison's Great Odds. So, Ralph, what is, what, um, you know, um, in all those years that you went there, what was your most vivid memories of the old place? You know, my most vivid memory was going to the circus early with my uncle and having him take me up to where the orchestra, they had an orchestra band. Wow. Um, and I got to, before they were setting up, and my uncle g- 
got permission for me to hit the cymbals. <laughs> and the, the place was virtually empty. Yeah. Um, people filling up and the sound, a kid hitting the cymbals and having the sound reverberate um, throughout the garden was uh, was a thrill. I mean, um, that was the number one, my number one memory of the garden. And aside from the smell of the garden, when the circus was going on, and the... Um, and the freak show, they had a um, a separate little freak show. When you come in, you get to see all the um, the folks who are different in, than us in different ways. <laughs> it was uh, uh, impressionable, but that's before sports. Um, yeah. The thing that I remember most about the garden as a sports fan was as a kid, we get to use what they call the geo card, general something, general admission or uh, yeah, I think general, general organization. organization. Yeah. Right. Every school had um, printed up geo cards, and uh, you'd I think it was thirty five cents a month, and you'd be a you get to um, use the card, and it. Um, the Rangers and Knicks would allow kids in at an incredible discount. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I don't remember the, um, how much exactly, but um, it was like a hundred dollar twenty five or something like that. Yeah. And the race up to the balcony to get seats when they open the doors. There on the side balcony, you they. You could only see clearly for a number of rows of the the first uh, ten rows or whatever, and uh, sitting there, um, unless you got um, a lower row, you there was a restricted uh, view. You, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't remember what it was, but but you couldn't see a portion of the ice. Right, so right. I remember it, there was uh, the co- basically a competition to get the get the seats and uh, yeah. running up the stairs and uh, and down. That was uh, that was exciting too. And um, and then when they came out, um, the fanfare and the, they uh, light the spotlight on guys. Um, and, and um, as opposed to, to baseball, which we both love, and um, it's nothing wrong with the with the with the fans' um, uh, view in baseball, but basketball and hockey at the Garden, it was such an intimate. You were so close, and you um, so that that's my memory. Yeah, when I when I interviewed Bob Nevin once for a book, he when he came to the Rangers, he 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 was uh, fully uh, expecting someone to fall off the balcony onto the ice because it was so close. Um, really, those those first few rows of the of the side balcony were controlled by people. Whoever there there were people uh, who would uh, put their coats over over the seats. And if you paid them, they would move the coat, and you sit. You could sit there. Yeah, you know, that was before. Oh. That was before the garden put you know numbers on seats. And um, supposedly, I don't know if it's true or not, but I had read that uh, years ago the Rangers had a beat reporter named Norm McLean, and his father supposedly controlled some of those seats back then. So um, everybody's out to make a buck, you know. Yeah, uh, just the way it is in sports today. Everybody yeah. says, well, money controls everything, this, that, and the other thing. They did then. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, just on um, 
TV and the media has made it a bigger arena. But um, by then, if you look at it at that point as a microcosm of what it is now, um, you'll find that um, it was all motivated by money. And that's how sports is. And that's the biggest disappointment for a kid when he realizes that um, that players are traded for financial reasons, uh, signed for financial reasons. Um, It's just... um, it's just the way it is, and that's part of um, growing up and realizing that it isn't just a kid's game. Uh, what it is is um, is controlled by greed, mostly. Yeah. yeah. Now, as far as my my uh, memories of the place, uh, they they actually uh, uh, begin at the uh, Port Authority building when we got my father and I got off the bus. We had to walk up Eighth Avenue. One one time we walked up with Ranger uh, broadcaster Win Elliott, and I was asking him questions. And um, I always liked walking past the Cameo Theater, which was a uh, the strip house, and uh, they had pictures of the girls out front with you know black tape over the good parts. And um, so that was that was pretty cool. And the um, the ice cream. At the garden, they had that little that little square box with the round cup of uh, vanilla ice cream in it. Then you squeeze the stick, or you you move the stick, and the ice cream would move up. If I remember, real 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 chocolate sauce in the middle with that wooden spoon, and uh, it was great. But uh, you know, as far as the games are concerned. my father brought me there when I was a little kid, and he, after the game, he 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 um, brought me down by the ice and showed me the penalty boxes and the benches, and he showed me where the broadcasters sat, and he kind of made it known that this was our team, you know. So I didn't really have a choice in the matter, but um, the uh, one game that re- really uh, sticks out for me was uh, Game Four of the 1967 playoffs. Uh, the Rangers hadn't, that was the first year the Rangers made the playoffs since I was a fan. And um, they had lost the first three games to Montreal. You know, the Rangers uh, were a red tag team still back then, and Montreal was the Canadians. They had John Bellavo and they had all these great players. And they took the, the, the fourth game to overtime. And my father had stood on line uh, a week before on a Sunday morning and got us tickets to games three and four. And for the games three, we had seats, but the, the game four, we had to stand up in the uh, mezzanine behind the, the last row of the mezzanine, which was pretty good. It was a pretty good you know, sight lines, except you had to stand up. And um, that was the game that in, uh, in overtime, Red Berenson grabbed a loose puck and he came in a Rogi Vishan, and he beat him, but he hit the post. And then a couple shifts later, somebody, uh, the, the play was down at the Ranger end, and Eddie Jockerman made a save, but the puck was laying in the crease on the opposite side of where he was. And big John Ferguson comes in and takes a swipe at it, and he misses. And he, then he takes another swipe at it, and he knocked it in, which which the overtime winner. And oh, wow. at that time, at that time, once that puck went in, you could hear a pin drop. You could actually hear the the Montreal players on the ice celebrating. It was so quiet in the garden. But then, then everybody got up, you know, and and gave the you know gave the Rangers a standing ovation because, you know, they you know they did give us a good season and they 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 played very well. They you know as well as they could back then, but. Um, that was um, that was then. Uh, I had gone to uh, to uh, circuses and rodeos at the garden, and the thing I oh had always, yes, I forgot uh, I forgot about them rodeos. Uh, um, the, the thing I always hated about it was that they used to sell these little flashlights 
are these little flimsy red strings. And at a certain point, all the kids were supposed to twirl them around their fingers, you know, so that, you know, you have all these lights spinning around in the crowd. And I knew damn well that one of those strings is going to break and that, that damn place I was going to come, to, come out and hit me in the eye. So I, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of, I, you know, I kind of leaned back in my chair and let everybody else get in it. I just, you know, right. celebration for, is for the rights of the brave. Not for everybody. You just you you can't celebrate in this unless you really have reason. <laughs> and uh, keeping your eye is a good thing. Yeah. So, what else? All right. Well, I have I have some memories of um, that I've shared with you about um, autographs. As a kid, we went down for autographs a lot, and. Um, uh, I've told this story not only to you, but uh, on the air, on the podcast, a number of times. But it uh, was indicative of the times and the, the way that the closeness between the players and the fans didn't exist at, at that time. And as, a, as um, an example, um, the players at that time would go out of their way to make sure that everybody that was asking for an autograph was accommodated. The kids were, everybody got one, but boom. Whereas baseball, um, for the most part, uh, the players were somewhat friendly, but uh, uh, a lot of them made a living by... Uh, not a living, but their reps by not being nice to the kids and yeah. not signing deliberately. Um, a lot of it was the, that um, basically kids weren't a, as well-mannered in New York. Uh, I've talked to players who said uh, uh, kids were very ill-mannered and uh, they wouldn't ask for, you know, they uh, give me an autograph, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. as an adult, I can now see what would turn the player off to, uh, to communication with the kids, but not in hockey. Hockey, um, I can't remember which hotel, the Manhattan or the Roosevelt, uh, players would stay and they'd all come out of a revolving door and line up with their bags, with the hockey bags, no one to carry them that, well, but the player. That, well, um, and they get ready to get on the bus. And while they were getting ready, uh, they were very amicable to the, the kids. And um, so I uh, was able to communicate uh, with them. Um, and getting back to uh, Val Fontaine, um, a ranger um, uh, forward. I, I think he was a, a left wing, but um, yeah. mostly a, a penalty killer. Um, he's on his way in. He's a, it's the home team. And I had just bought a... Um, a range of blue book that year and um, with plans um, to get somebody I, I made up a self-addressed envelope and and what have you and um, paid the postage for it and I asked him if he wouldn't um, not only give me an autograph but if he wouldn't because my, we didn't get a chance to meet the, the home team very often. Um, if he wouldn't uh, take take the thing into into the dressing room, they called it the room, and, um, and get us to sign it. And damn yeah. if he didn't get everybody on the ranges except Marcel Paye. Mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, one of the backup goalies for Jacques right. Plante. 
and uh, he I missed him for or um, he was missed for one reason or another. But yeah. carefully, um, each player signed, and they had an um, uh, what is it? Uh, they had an autograph on the picture itself. They had yeah. it, um, and the, the players would sign over it. And it was amazing. Back then, players had, in all sports, had much better handwriting. So you can clearly see that right. um, who they right. were. And um, I remember a couple of, couple of days later, it comes in the mail. The, not a note or anything, but mm-hmm. just a range of blue book with everybody that signed it. That was a thrill, I got. I got to say, that's and, a, um, a range of blue book may have been uh, edited by Hal Bach. He, that, he I think. Uh, I think that one wasn't. We talked at, at okay. one time. Um, about it, but how Bob did, did that job? Um, yeah. He was one of those guys, and we've talked to him um, uh, and hockey broadcast, basketball broadcast. Um, it's just uh, he has an amazing uh, uh, history, uh, amazing career in sports. Does how Bob and. Um, uh, I've been blessed to get, uh, have him uh, on the, the podcast on a regular basis for years and years. Well, um, uh, the one thing that always impressed me about the old garden was the way they cleaned the ice. This was in the uh, pre-Zamboni days. And, you know, at the end of the period, they used to have three guys walking around with a shovel. And um, each guy, each shovel was placed so that it would catch the shovels in front of him his his uh, overflow, and they would push them around and do and, and make make you know small circles and get it all ice all, all off the ice, and then they um, then they came out with the the uh, real barrels uh, like a like a drum uh, pointed uh, that was painted red white and blue and two guys would skate behind um, the the uh, real barrel and um, Push this 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 uh, this uh, contraption that would that would uh, lay down a new coat of warm water on the ice to, to uh, smooth it out, and that was really my first uh, aspiration for a job. I wanted to do that, but uh, of course it never happened. But the, but the funny thing is that um, at that time. At that time, I have a friend who lives in uh, Cleveland, and he was a big fan of the Cleveland Barons of the American Hockey League minor league team. They had chicken wire on their on their board where we had glass, but they had a zamboni. Whoa! You know, Before the Rangers, Cleveland, Cleveland in the minor leagues, they had a freaking zamboni, and you know we we had these guys with the um, you know wheelbarrow. Which you know, it was it was a simple time, and I I guess it was Gladys Gooding at the organ. She used to play like like uh, you know skating music while they were pushing this wheelbarrow around, and um, that was what I wanted to do with, with my life at that time as a as an eight year old, you know. So well, you couldn't do much better at that <laughs> at that age. Uh, what job could you get to? That you could skate, skate yeah. around I'm the ring. Yep. Right. And a lot of people don't realize that there was a practice ring upstairs right. from the garden, and um, they so they opened it up. Um, you could go in there and and skate. Um, I'm sure, you pay something. I don't remember what. But I remember, the, and it had the lines all laid out. And yeah. I was, as a kid in New York, everybody learns to ice skate, or roller skate, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So not that I was any great shakes, but I could put the skates on 
with that ankle thing to protect yeah, my yeah. Fra- fragile ankles from turning. I remember it was a uh, it's like a little thing that you wore under under the skate. But yeah, um, mm-hmm. right, and we'd skate around, and um, I I don't know if that was if they. Regular, if the Rangers regularly practiced up there or not, I think they had another practice facility somewhere along the lines. But I know at least at times they would use that. Um, so you, were, so as a kid, you were skating on the same ice um, as the Rangers, and. Um, that way I'd come down the right side and I'd be mm-hmm. Andy Bathgate. You know, that, um, wow, good memories. One of my, uh, 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 my AARP line mates on the Ripper Rangers show, Rich Isaac, learned how to skate up there. And um, the uh, east side of the building, um, they had that, those, those, uh, bo- those uh, glass blocks on the uh, the east side of the building and when the sun came up in the morning um it was very glaring and you couldn't see and uh i remember Emil francis saying that he he couldn't practice up there because of that whoever was the goalie on the other side on the west side of the, the rink wouldn't be able to see the puck coming because of the the glare coming off the the um the glass blocks and also, they had uh, tin boards. They didn't have wooden or plastic boards. They had tin boards. And he was always saying that if that if a player um, happened to hit his blade uh, on those tin boards, he would have to he would have to take the elevator to two or three stories downstairs to get his skate resharpened and come back up again. And by that time, practice would be over. So he really couldn't oh, have. Wow practices they could skate they could they could like you know do um you know skating drills but they couldn't really practice up there so that was, yeah, but um, at, least, at least they made an attempt and they were there trying yeah. to practice so as a kid um my fantasy is uh are complete uh, on that um yeah uh, George, let me ask you, did you ever go to a, a Nick Ranger doubleheader in the same day? No, but I did go to, uh, uh, they used to play um, in the exhibition season, they used to play two basketball games once in a while. Um, they, they used to, um, and the Knicks were always the later game, but they had uh, two other teams playing the first game. And I remember the the first time I went there for a basketball game, you know, you're going up the you know, you're walking to the garden, you're going up the escalator, you you know, you're talking to your friend, you, you you're not thinking about what you're doing because you've done it so many times. And I remember reaching our level and looking out and not seeing the ice. I saw a basketball court. <laughs> oh, wow, okay, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let me tell you that um, I don't remember if there was a basketball game first or then a hockey game or a hockey game first and then yeah. a basketball game. I I tend to think the basketball game that um, was first, but they cleared the garden. So everybody that was um, after the, the first game, everybody – that um, all the crowd had, it. you'd have to pay again to to get in. Kids would hide and um, evade the the guards and what have you between games. They'd hide in the restroom. Yeah. They they'd have to be chased. Uh, you know, it was a fucking a quarter. You didn't want to pay it again. <laughs> the, but one of the things that uh, these kids, me included, who uh, were risk confrontation with adults, which uh, was something a kid didn't want to do under any circumstances, let alone be chased by a bunch of, of guards. 
but we got to watch them turn. Um, it must have been taken down the basketball court, and because under under that was the ice, and um, so they take down the basketball court and give us some entertainment in um, in those hour and a half, two hours, were whatever it was to clear the garden and to start all over again. And, um, but I got to see some construction and all my life I, uh, evaded work, but I love to watch other people work. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I respected construction uh, like in, in New York, when they were building something, they'd have little, they'd board off the area, but they'd have little peepholes where right, you could right. see them. You could look, yeah. You know, whatever, whatever project, you could walk by and uh, see what was going on. I love to watch. I was fascinated by, by all of that. Um, and I got to see the deconstruction of... Um, the basketball court and they tore it down. I don't know, know what they did with the panels. I uh, I don't have any recollection recollection of what um, what the process was, but I do remember it was fat. It was work and um, watch whatever it is. I respect people who have a skill who. Um, work hard, who, um, but it just wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, it was some sort of allergy and aversion. And if my, my mother were alive, she confirmed that. Um, do you want one more memory? Yeah, sure. Okay. This isn't a, a hockey. It's a basketball memory. Okay. And it was, it was the first year. Um, that Wilt, it must have been 59, that Wilt played with the Warriors. And um, Wilt, people don't realize, Wilt was like Gretzky. His yeah. his stats were so far um, um, different than any, any other player of their time. They just, uh, you know, Gretzky, Babe Ruth, this, this, that, and the other thing. But um, Russell was another one. And um, one day, early on, um, before the game, Knicks are playing, and uh, we go down to the the hotels in Manhattan, the Roosevelt, uh, wherever they were staying. And I think the, the Celtics coming in was staying at the, the Manhattan, uh, picked that hotel. And the walk was about six or seven blocks to the short blocks from the hotel to the garden. Right. And as a kid, um, just mingling around, trying to find whoever it is that would – Give me an autograph. And um, there's this rumor going on um, at that time that Bill Russell would not sign autographs for anyone, right. even his whole, own teammates. He had right. uh, later he copped out and signed a lot, signed at shows and whatever. But at that time, he wouldn't sign an autograph. So I caught him with a reserve center named Wayne Embry, who was a pretty good center with Cincinnati beforehand, but um, Allback had a, a habit of uh, getting the last two or three players uh, on his roster were always veterans, guys like Willie Knowles uh, come to mind, um, Don Nelson later on, but uh, Wayne Embry was that crusty old veteran who would back up Russell. 
And they are both hand in hand, walking a tandem, walking to the garden. And uh, Wayne Embry was about, um, he was as wide as he was big. And yeah, tall. He, yeah. Yeah. He was intimidating. And um, the idea of Bill, Bill Russell was intimidating. But me, gutsy, ballsy, young kid, um, went up to Bill Russell. And there was also a, a rumor that before every game, he, Bill Russell, out of nerves, would throw up, literally throw up in, in the dressing room. And that was his preparation. Yeah. So the Knicks had a center. At that time, the Knicks were horrible. This is the pre uh, the pre greatness days of uh, the Knicks dynasty with Willis and um, and Walt Frazier and but the Knicks were not very good. And the reason they were not very good is because their center, whoever it was, and there were a number of them. Phil Jordan um, comes to mind. Ray Felix. They were not very competitive. And um, the center at that time was Charlie Tyree. And Tyree was just simply uh, not very good compared to the competition. And that's why they were horrible. So I'm walking and Embry and Russell, they're very determined and they're on the way to the garden. I said... I came up to Mr. Mr. Russell or Bill Russell, and I said, "Mr. Russell, I said, um, I know you're in a hurry, but you're playing Charlie Tyree today, and you don't have to really be in a hurry. You don't have to throw up for this one. There's no he. You're going to win, <laughs> or something like that." And he cackled. He, I mean, he just that, that laugh, yeah, yeah. That laugh that um, you we hear on uh, clips and what have you, but right. he cackled, and he looked at. I said, "Sir, could you please sign my autograph book?" And uh, he takes it, much to my surprise, and starts writing. And I said, "To Ralph, best wishes." Because <laughs> um, sometimes the players w- would um, would personalize the autograph for you, <laughs> but I had the balls to ask him uh, sign it to me with best wishes and uh, with that. Yeah. And he looks at me and he just kind of shakes his hand and he signed Bill Russell. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was it. And um, later on. In life, I had, um, um, I don't even remember who it was, a woman friend, which one it was, but a woman friend decoupaged that autograph for me on a wooden piece, of, and I still have it. I don't know if it reduced, decoupaging it reduced the value, yeah, but yeah. I, uh, but Either way, I got a Gordie Howe in her, uh, autograph about that time and didn't have a decoupage, and that that autograph um, has gone with me from place to place, from wall to wall, and um, it's faded. I can't even tell that Gordie Howe signed it, which is another story. Uh, hockey players would sit with you in the hotel before games, and they'd sit in the lobby with you and chat. The only the only athletes that would do that, the kids. And one day, Gordy Howe sat, had me sit down next to him in one of the armchairs in, in the, the lobby. That's and funny. I, and I chatted with him. But, yeah. um, but, but my point is the decoupage autograph did not wear out. Yeah. And I can still see to Ralph best wishes. Yeah. Um, and um, so most of my memories uh, revolve around interactions with players, even um, 
even if they were short, I remember Eddie Shack coming out of uh, he was uh, after he was a ranger. I, I think he, he was with Toronto. He yes. must have been. Yeah, Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, and he's coming out of the revolving door with his bag of sticks, or I don't know if they were sticks, but his bag of equipment, which was loaded up, and it's on his shoulder, and he couldn't get out of the revolving door. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and um, and I, <laughs> but he was so nice when he came out, yeah. and he was um. Apparently, he couldn't write at that time. I don't know no, if he learned no, he later. Can't write, huh? um, so he had a little stamp, and he yeah. signed the autograph. Um, they'd have picture postcards made up for them, all the players. And mostly they signed it beforehand so they yeah. wouldn't have to sign. You know, they'd just yeah. reach in and get, get the card out. But um, I remember Eddie Shack. Uh, was a facsimile autograph. That's the, what I was yeah. looking for on um, when I was talking about the blue, the blue book. If, um, and um, so my interaction was with Eddie Shack. Talking to a, an, an illiterate, um, he was figuring like me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, um it wasn't a very deep conversation, but it was Eddie Shack, yeah. and Eddie Shack could get up and down the ice. He had this rambling way of um, his head would uh, bob up and down as he skated. <laughs> right, but he was—he's a pretty good hockey player, you know. He, he, could, he was a he skate through six guys on the ice, and and shoot the puck uh, against the boards. He he he. You know, there's so many times that he would make fantastic plays going up and down the ice, but he just wouldn't score. So that's that was Eddie Shack. But right. uh, he he won a bunch of uh, Stanley Cups with with uh, Toronto. So God bless him. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Toronto, and I just got to tell you, um, the guy that comes to mind there uh, is Red Kelly. Yeah. And Red Kelly. And these guys would stand out of the, in front of the hotel, and um, you'd get to see an all-star team yeah. right in front of you. You know, yeah. guys that were, were absent, Johnny Bauer, uh, Red Kelly, um, and they talked to you like you were a human being and you were a kid, and it, right. validated, it validated your childhood that it made you think, wow, I could, uh, I'm a human being. And, yeah. um, yeah, that's, um, those are great. But the smell of the circus stands out more than anything yeah. in terms of memory. Um, right. Right. how are we doing on time, Ralph? We're coming close, but, um, but I got, still time I got, for you to, I got, I got two things. Uh, one one is a basketball story actually, but it's it's the new garden, it's not the old garden. I was over I was over by the new garden with my friend Tom Brzezinski once. We were, I guess we were going to Cosby's, and across the street I see Metal Mark Lemon from the Harlem Globetrotters. Oh and wow! I yell, and I yelled to him, "Hey, Metal Mark!" And he puts his hand up and says, "Hey, baby!" And I poked <laughs> 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 Tom in, in the ribs and says. See, he knows me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, um, other, and the other thing I want to tell people is that <laughs> um, if you're in the Alameda area on uh, November 11th, Ralph is having a book signing. So, uh, Ralph, you want to tell us about that? Well, first, I want to talk about why the book is available. George Grimm was my co author. And George Grimm wrote uh, my interviews with people and George Grimm turning it into a book. Peter Golenbach, very, very, uh, if you're not into sports, you wouldn't know the name. But if you were in any way, you'd no note that 
Peter Golenbach, um, his word means a lot to both George and I. And right. we, asked, we asked him to, to write the forward of the book. And he wrote that the book was brilliant, and I'm quoting, brilliant, brilliantly written. And um, I've got those two words set up as the, uh, in the first paragraph of my obituary. And I hope it's not this week, or, or but um, I'm gonna that'll be in there. You wrote a book that Peter Goldenbach said was brilliantly written. It made my day, and it made uh, the rest of my my life. But the book itself is available on Amazon, and I will be reading a um, some ex- excerpts from the book and have a discussion with folks um, in hopes the name that of the book they'll... Is, is, is a couple of his own in Nevada Pine Tar. And it's a um, paperback book, and as Ralph says, it's available on, on Amazon. And he'll be, he'll be signing copies at the Alameda Senior Center November 11th, I think, right? Yes, Veterans Day. So if you feel inclined to celebrate with a fellow veteran, uh, that's me. I was um, in the Air Force um, and missed, um, missed a lot of hockey by living out in California, being stationed out here and stayed out here. It's very difficult for me to follow hockey out here. And... Um, so my memories are just that. But um, I remember it used to be six teams, and I remember that St. Louis came in. And um, Ray Berenson, you mentioned him before, was um, – I think he was a, a first-round draft pick in the expansion draft by St. Louis – who called themselves the Blue Shirts or something like that. St. Louis Blues. St. Louis Blues. And I thought at that time, I remember being in the Air Force and um, saying, why would they call themselves the Blues? The the Rangers were the Blue Shirts. And and I realized, uh, welcome to expansion. The league was great with six teams, just like the NBA was great when it only had eight teams. And those double headers, um, if you figure it out, the um, four teams was half the league. Yeah. So, so a kid could go down for autographs and potentially rack up before those double headers. And, um, boy, uh, um, those memories warm my heart. An old guy's heart is warmed because of his thoughts. So um, I want to thank you for sharing that with me and um, having me as a guest on your on your program. On your network. Um, yes, yeah, thanks for being here, Ralph. <laughs> I really had a good time. Uh, one thing I just want to say about the 16 NHL. When I was a kid, there were six teams, of course, and I knew every player on every team. Now there are 32 teams, and if you ask me to name all 32 teams, I would have to think about it for a while. I would have to, I would have to give it a lot of thought. So I could probably let alone the indi- let alone the individual stars on yeah. that team or the individual scrubs on that team. And, um, oh, you know, speaking of hockey and going down for autographs, this week Willie O'Ree celebrated something or another, you know, 60 years or 70 his years. Birthday, yeah. yeah, or his birthday, and yeah. it was on Facebook. And Willie O'Ree was one of those guys that we go down to see. And he was the first Afro-American to play in the league. 
but he right. wasn't a, a big star. And every now and then his team would come in without him. He'd be shuffling up from the minor, minors. But I got to see him, and I remember meeting him wow. uh, one time. And uh, that he's still alive today is is great. Um, yeah. So many of us aren't. <laughs> and um, uh, old age gives one an appreciation for life that um, we didn't have as kids. We did. We took it for granted that everybody would live to be a, a ripe old age. And um, sadly, uh, friends, relatives, um, acquaintances, ball players, musicians, they die. You know, we all do. And um, so let's keep from doing that this week, um, if you would, um, George. I'll try. Um, okay. Um, That's all you can do. Uh, well, thanks for being on, Ralph. I appreciate you, the time. We had a good time. And uh, uh, the Retro Rangers will be back soon. Uh, Ralph probably has a show coming up as well. So um, we'll be in touch. Thanks for listening. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, hey. goodbye for now. Thanks. Thanks for including me, George. It's uh, no it's it's always fun talking to you. No Good to be here. Do. All, All right. right. Stay healthy. Sigasund. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.